Hey guys, today we have one of the most interesting folks in the in the business, Ramphus Castro on the program. He's an investor, he's a startup guy, he's a lot of things. Thanks for coming today, Ramphus. Thanks for the invite, Mike. So Ramphus, you have a really, am I pronouncing it right first of all? I'm terrible with names. No, it's Ramphus, like Memphis with an R. Like Memphis with an R, I like it. Thanks for coming today. So I wanted to get you on the program because of what you're doing with Science Fest, essentially looking at investing in companies and in ideas that typically would not get funding. So talk me a little bit through that and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into your story. Sure, sure. So Science Fest is a first check deep tech venture capital fund, uh, impact only. Uh, so we, we focus on breakthrough core technology companies uh, that change the way uh, something is done right now. Uh, that are typically commercializing uh, intellectual property from universities. Uh, and the thesis came about as part of my work as a Kaufman Fellow uh, for trying to figure out the, solve the funding gap for science uh, around uh, supporting very early stage core breakthrough technology companies. Why is there such a large funding gap for science? Is it the timeframes? <sighs> Not really. So that's changed quite a bit uh, from the way things are done before. I think you've seen uh, some of the changes in terms of things that we take for granted in startups in terms of the lowering cost of uh, cloud computing, the lowering cost of storage uh, to areas of uh, deep technology around synthetic biology uh, and biomanufacturing, uh, cost of genome sequencing, those kinds of things. Uh, definitely has pushed forward what's, what's the opportunity that's available for founders to start companies earlier. Uh, but what's the, the biggest challenge uh, by far uh, is that from investors, from these founders having the right kind of partners uh, on the capital side that understand uh, early enough how to be helpful at that stage. So everybody tends to see these companies as outside of their core area of expertise. So everything is too early for most uh, investors, even though they, the, these companies uh, are, don't necessarily have regulatory risk uh, or they're doing something that uh, when you compare from a risk and justice basis into uh, other companies uh, in the space, it's just the opportunity is much larger. Basically, they're transformational for the nature of reality, a lot of these type of companies. And yet, because they are so transformational, it takes a ton of time and money to get them to market? Not, not, it's not the time and money. It just it requires a particular set of expertise to get there. Right? The team that you have to build around yourself to do that uh, is, is a little bit different. And it's typically outside of the core expertise of how most investors feel that they can be specifically helpful. Uh, I think we could kind of dig into that a little bit, but yeah. Definitely. What, uh, what areas are you most excited about? So definitely the, the intersection of computational research as, uh, and biology, right? that mix of, so think of it as the, the drug discovery uh, for, for uh, using AI, right? Those, those kinds of uh, opportunities. Uh, think of also around synthetic biology uh, and biomanufacturing, right? like creating custom, uh, custom chemicals for uh, specific applications. Uh, and then how does that change? So for example, you know, around you know, the fragrance industry, right? companies like Ginkgo, Bioworks, right? those kinds of, are examples of companies that are just extremely exciting and, and there are opportunities now that uh, were, not, uh, were not really possible uh, 10, 20 years ago. And that's primarily due to the cost of compute coming down and then the cost of genome sequencing coming down. Uh, there, there's a mix of things that make this, that are in certain enabling technologies, but the think of uh, a lot of all these trends coming together, right? So AI, machine learning, uh, access to computing, cloud computing, um, the integration, the better understanding of some areas of biology as well, uh, and all these areas coming together in a cross-discipline way. Right? So now you have professionals uh, that essentially grew up uh, uh, with the internet and with a lot of these different technologies. So they might be uh, a hardcore uh, biologists with uh, extremely strong uh, computer science skills as well. Is the 21st century going to be defined by biotech and synthetic biology like the last was by compute and mechanical power? That's a, that's a great question. I definitely think that that is, that is one of the areas that I'm most excited about, right? the opportunity for that to be the case. For, so we do have line of sight to actually really think about these things now, right? For these things coming together in a way that we can think about. So really radical ideas such as, uh, instead of just curing cancer, uh, to really understanding uh, how the underlying biology works to cause cancer uh, and prevent that, right? And so instead of going therapies that target uh, the, the effects of, of cancer, to actually be able to go after creating technologies that prevent uh, the, the actual, the actual um, process of uh, cancer from happening in that way. 
Yeah, let's, yeah. Wear a hel- let's wear a helmet while we ride the bike versus fixing the head afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly, that's a great metaphor. It's incredible how backwards the industry is, but I'm, I'm very excited to see some of the things that are happening. What I get a little bit worried about with, with that space specifically is trying to come up with technical solutions without addressing the underlying actual problems, which is typically nutrition and exercise. I've seen I've seen some really compelling stuff to say cancer is primarily a metabolic disease. So, so I think that's where we we all just generally to be careful because the, the the area and going back to my background, right? I'm a computer engineer by training, and my partner's more on the biotech side. Uh, is that the biology, the understanding of the underlying biology? We still have a long way to go in a lot of areas, right? So think of a lot of things are more black box related than the specifics. We 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 you know biology biology does not behave like computer code where you can tell it what to do, and actually, you know for a fact, they'll always work in that very specific way. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, uh, which is where the opportunity is for a lot of these technologies like uh, AI and others uh, to permeate the space so that we can better understand just the basics uh, of how biology works and how other aspects of, of that biology work together. So think of more genomics and proteomics and some of these areas where uh, it's not enough to know how some of the biology works, but how does it work with you and your specific makeup? And what does that mean uh, for, for how we're building and designing and thinking about uh, how we're going after some of this, these potential solutions? How, do, how should scientists think about move fast and break things? Like if you invest in the company that accidentally creates a CRISPR plague, we, we have some trouble. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think that's where the core science matters a lot, right? Like we fundamentally, in our case, uh, we start with the science uh, first, right? We really want to understand what's, what's going on, who's behind it, who's actually got it. So most of the companies that we back, the founders that we work with, uh, this is their life's work and their advisors, it's their life's work as well. Uh, so the, the expertise around a particular area of knowledge, uh, you know, they, it is at the, the edge of what humans know, period. Uh, and, and it's an extremely hard space to operate in. Uh, and just as scientists, you know, from an ethics standpoint, uh, everybody does the best that they can with the tools that we have. So be mindful of uh, what are the consequences and what are the outcomes or something that uh, they are constantly thinking about. And something we also look for uh, deeply, we care about deeply for the founders that we support, right? We want founders that are thinking about this. That's part of their, their driving mission is to really understand the, potential unintended consequences of what they're building and the drivers of why and, uh, and all these things. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are things to worry about. It's very difficult. It's very, it's very difficult. I wouldn't say it's for almost impossible to know what the potential unintended consequences might be for enabling technologies that we have now, right? It's just like talking about social media and internet addiction now, uh, where, you know, it was not obvious necessarily, you know, 20 years ago, or maybe all of us on the open source side that that, that would be the case. And now things are moving significantly faster, but that is also, that is technology. How do you deal with universities who can oftentimes be a bit of IP whores in terms of scientists create something incredible and then the university wants to steal it? So I think, I think the, the, the challenges for universities, and that's an area that is not talked about enough that we all need to work together on, is, is really to help the universities understand that uh, the best outcome for them is that the founders and the scientists that created the technology that actually want to build companies around it is how you create wealth for the university uh, as well, right? When you think of the largest or most well-known universities, they are a part of uh, some of the more iconic companies uh, that, that are spun out from, from their research labs. Uh, and then the, uh, the alumni understand the help that they receive from the university. So it is in the university's best interest to help their uh, potential entrepreneur scientists to spin out technology so that when they make it, hopefully some of them will make it, uh, then they come back and build them you know, a new bio lab or a new engineering lab, which we see all the time uh, at some of the larger campuses. So, so it's something to rethink, for universities to rethink their position. Many of them are, uh, and they understand the pressure that they're under, uh, and they know that their model for uh, licensing uh, in the way that they did it do, do not, does not work for them. Yeah, ba- basically it's a dying model based off of a monopoly. How do you think yeah. about how do you think about scientists and researchers? They they kind of have two routes. They can go the academic university route and try to create IP and later possibly commercialize it or find an entrepreneur to do so, or they can go directly the startup route and then try to create a business like a twenty three andme style. Yeah, uh, I think I mean for scientists, 
it, it really depends. There are different, different motivations for, for different types of scientists. Uh, so, some of them, uh, and, and, and I, I divide them in two buckets, right? I mean, the basics of research, and, and we need more of everything, period, right? Around all kinds of, of fields of science. Uh, and, and, and that's required. That has a very long, long-term horizon to really create this enabling technologies. Think about the, the uh, core kind of, you know, creating the TCP IP protocols back in the day and operating systems and kernels, like these kinds of really core enabling technologies on one side and also on the biology side. And then applied sciences. Right? How do you take something that actually works uh, and you think about how does that apply to real, solving a real problem in the real world? Uh, and, and scientists can jump from back and forth, right? I ha we have some that are really keen on the research side and they, that's where the best at and some other members of the team are really uh, strong on the commercialization aspect, but you need both, right? You need really strong research uh, focused uh, scientists that can really lead through those teams and scientists that understand uh, why it matters to the to the greater good for humanity. Speaking of greater good, what should be open sourced? Like you brought up HTTP and uh, whatever the other one was, which were great internet protocols where the creators essentially earned absolutely no money. And yet yeah. at the same time, how do we think about that in terms of the biotech industry going forward? Well, I think that the key challenge there is around publishers, right? And the control of the articles. So when you think about intellectual property, I mean, the patents, when you patent something, right, I'm, I'm on the IP, it's my background as a lawyer, uh, when, you, when you patent something, the idea is that you have a certain exclusivity for a certain amount of time, and then in exchange, you release it, right? So essentially, most of the technology, so Google's PageRank algorithm, for example, right? And, and that's, that's out there. Uh, and you can think about the same thing for, for uh, biology. So the papers, especially the papers, right? The IP is IP, but the papers themselves, for that to be accessible to everyone in, a, in, a, in an easier fashion uh, is definitely where we should be trending and, and what we should be discussing, right? So like open, you know, open publications uh, and, uh, and sort of open sourcing uh, those data sets uh, that enable the research so that others can, can leverage that. So uh, a lot of that is, is out there and happening, and there's a lot of cross-pollination uh, and collaboration across scientists. Uh, the key challenge is around some of the access to the papers for those from outside academic institutions who may not have access to the, uh, the publishers themselves. Also, what gets published? So you look at Big Pharma and they'll take a drug, they'll try to guess what it does, they'll test out people to find the perfect people for the test. They'll run four tests, one of them will be successful, so that's the only one they publish. How do you think about, how do you think about the ethics? Typically, the pharma industry has been incredibly dirty and mercenary. How do you think about the biotech industry to avoid making those mistakes while still making money? So I think on the, on the biotech side, I mean, it's a huge, massive sort of global industry. And I think you know, we can go into like all way, but the, the sort of bite-sized version of that is that uh, a, lot, the, a lot of the industry understands that a lot of the innovation is happening outside of their core research facilities, right? So if you think about kind of what they're focused on in researches, et cetera, and kind of what they're focusing researches, uh, they understand now that they need to partner with uh, startups and companies uh, to be able to access some of that uh, core innovation uh, and then for them to focus on what they do best right which is sort of scaling up those kinds of operations and other aspects of that research and industrial R&D and some of those aspects so so it's really around collaboration and, and, and improving uh, and streamlining more about how that process works which a lot of them are moving in that direction right we, we talk about New York and, and, and Silicon Valley elsewhere uh, where you have a lot of these programs coming online to facilitate that, like the J Labs, right? We have uh, strong collaborations between industry and startups for the purposes of these startups to leverage corporate resources, and, and it works the other way around. Um, Indie Bio, right, which is opening a, a new campus in New York, uh, Creative Destruction Labs opening a campus in New York um, with uh, collaboration with NYU, I believe. Um, so th those are happening where the industry understands that there's a huge opportunity for doing more collaboration. And the startups, their ethos is around uh, sharing, right, and collaborating. Uh, it's, it's a lot of that sort of pay forward mentality. Um, but there's obviously a long way to go. Um, and in terms of having better access to everything for everyone at all times, it's, it's, it's a tricky, tricky space to navigate. What about topics for research focus? Most of, the, most of the funding is coming from grants, a lot of it from the government, which means if you want to tackle something potentially controversial, you may just not get funded like to do the MDMA research, to do the, to do the sex research, to do the things that the American government doesn't want to get on the record as being something they funded. Right. 
I mean, that is a challenge. Uh, I think the creative entrepreneurs, I mean, they, they find a way to pursue their curiosity on, and, and, and see where, where those different things lead. Um, uh, I think there just needs to be more conversation on how we fund more of everything, right? How we make that more accessible, how we uh, make it so that researchers are, are freer to pursue uh, their fields of interest across the board. Uh, and we see where the science goes, right? I think it's just a commitment to science uh, and publicly funded science and privately funded science. And there are all kinds of commitments to funding more science period uh, is really what's required at scale globally, right? When you think about uh, not just in the US or Canada or China, but just everywhere, right? There's so much we don't know yet about everything. Uh, so really is that commitment so that we can go and research this potentially controversial areas because Keep in mind, you know, those things might be controversial historically for different societal reasons now, but not necessarily uh, over time, right? And those views change. Uh, and, and it really is enabling the science to push forward that allows us to actually make things maybe less controversial uh, so that we understand more. So the controversy is around data and we can actually have discussion around real information and, and real knowledge versus just opinions on how things should be and, and why things should be the way they are. If you could wave a wand and fix some of the problems, what would you fix? The number one by far, which is what we're focused on at ScienceVest, uh, is around enabling more of the founders that are committed to building companies around their science to have access to that funding, right? In a way that they might not even need ScienceVest, right? Where they might just be able to do that and pursue that and invite the right partners to them uh, versus yeah, what we discussed with now. So that's one key one. It's really access to capital across the board, full stop. Uh, and then the other one would be around uh, impact uh, investing, right? So around things that matter, right? When, when these companies are successful, uh, it actually changes something for humanity, right? It's not like making the world a better place by better marketing tools, right? It's, you know, that's, that's fine, but uh, it's not something that uh, we, we care about. It's more around uh, how does your core technology uh, help, you know, real people stay healthier or real people, you know, manage their, uh, you know, their personal growth and their mental health, right? Like these things matter. Uh, and these founders should have better access to go after some of these things where right now, you know, they're competing with, you know, high end juicer, right? Of some kind. You brought up China a little earlier and China is investing a hell of a lot of money into this and other spaces. How do you think about the race that seems to be building up and really the direction of all of this? The, the, in my view, there's no race. Um, you know, the 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 commitment, the scale, the capital, the talent, the resources uh, that China is deploying uh, at scale. Uh, game over. Not just. The, I, I don't know about the game over. I, it's just that it is something that needs to be talked about more. The scale that we're talking about here. Okay, uh, where you know the in the U.S. For giving an example, uh, the the SBIR funding, which is sort of you know, the, the U.S.'s uh, version of their seed fund for science, our, our biggest co-investor on, on, on all, basically most of our deals, uh, you know, it's 2.5 billion a year. That's, you know, that, that's it. Uh, and in China, across the board, uh, there's hundreds of billions for being deployed across a wide array of uh, interest in research and commercialization, right? Um, so, and that's at scale on the government side, right? That's not to include all the other sources of capital um, that, that are available. So, it are just several orders of magnitude uh, of what's going on there than, than some of the interesting things are happening in the US. And to extrapolate, we, we decided that this would probably be the century of synthetic biology and biotech, which means this is the century that China becomes a dynasty again. Hmm. Uh, I don't know about China's like, in terms of, of that, because there's so much collaboration, so much talent, so much of everything that's required to really get there, right? And you need all hands on deck type of situation. So you need all the sciences and labs. I mean, the core expertise on the U.S. side and a lot of fields of science in, in Canada and Europe uh, and, and LADAM and everywhere, it really is off the charts, right? So it's, it's not a lack of research firepower and talent. Uh, really, it's a mix of talent and expertise for getting these things uh, to actually reach the market and, and to really uh, make it available for everyone, right? Where everyone globally, there's a more global conversation on how this uh, innovation actually happens uh, and that we're, we're a closer part of closer part of that discussion versus just saying, oh, you know, China will do X or Canada will do Y or US. It really is everybody together. Uh, if we're gonna have the kind of future that we, we talk about uh, that, we all, that we all want.
It is, but we have different speed limits, so to speak, in terms of morality and in terms of what we're willing to try. What are some of the stuff that's happening now in China off the record that you've heard of? Uh, China, like off the record, I mean, their the, the CRISPR research is, is fantastic, right? And these are following uh, global world-class standards, right? I mean, that's something that's a misconception about what's happening out there um, is that, you know, it's what people might have thought in the past. Uh, these are world-class labs. I mean, world-class contract research organizations. Uh, you know, some of the largest uh, of these types operate out of China. So a lot of the startups and others, uh, you know, use them for different aspects. So it is uh, uh, really amazing, right? So kind of, I guess, on the of the record side, uh, it really is the the, the research, the great, sort of well done sort of research that's been done on some of the core bleeding edge areas of science, like CRISPR, for example, right? genetics yeah it's a it's a really interesting it's a really interesting future any bold predictions or any myths that people need dispelled myths uh yeah the, the thing the number one is that it takes it takes um a significant amount of time um money and time uh for for these kinds of really complicated and the breakthrough technologies to both get to market uh and to find an exit right i think that is a huge huge myth um, there's great data around that. There's great articles um, uh, around uh, the both the biotech sector and other sectors, um, how how it operates. So I'll give you an example. All of our companies, when we invest, we're for first check. Um, these companies are always have a path to market through generating revenues, even though it'll take them many many years for different regulatory hurdles to to go through. That's that's fine, uh, but it doesn't mean that these guys are generating cash flow and. And a good example of that is a stem centrics, for example, right? Like one of the largest uh, exits uh, in the U.S. in, in recent memory uh, is essentially uh, a cancer-related uh, uh, company, uh, leveraging all the things that I'm discussing, right? So now everybody's on everybody's radar, and it was right in the middle of Silicon Valley, and every single investor, may, most of which, you know, many of which you maybe uh, interviewed here, they just missed it, right? It's just outside of their core expertise, but it was just sitting there. Um, and, and their companies, their funders and others that, um, you know, they saw that, right? That that is, that's how things are now. It's just different from where it used to be and how investing uh, used to be thought about. There's just much more opportunity. It just requires a different kind of lens for the investor to be able to see it and, and support those teams. And it's happening faster than expected. Absolutely. What would, be, what would be an over under timeline for when we see the first genetic doping for athletics, for performance, et cetera, in terms of some type of, CRISPR or otherwise based enhancements to enhance humanity. I'm sure, I'm sure some of that has been experimented across the board. I mean, now, I mean, when you think about, um, you know, uh, some of the, like, you, you can even go to nutrition, right? I mean, a part of nutrition is really changing the way your biology is sort of operating. That's sort of the, the, the purpose of it. So it's really extending that uh, now with what's with the understanding that we have on, on some areas of of biology. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised that it's ongoing. I mean, sports is sort of outside of sort of my our, our current core field. So uh, we, we don't, right? Like, and they, these enabling technologies for the purpose of sports uh, is not necessarily something that uh, we, we focus as much, but more around uh, health, right? And if it has applications to health and sports, and yes, but not for like on the performing enhancing side of, of the equation. Uh, so I'm sure it's happening. Uh, it's not something that uh, is of core to. Uh, to our radar. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure they're experimenting right now on all kinds of everything uh, that we've discussed um, to see what, what, you know, how to extract extra additional performance from, from humans. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's really interesting, especially when you have the fusion of the health and nutrition side of things. If you're really yeah. optimizing, do you see unequal access headed down the line for different populations? So that's something I really hope hope for uh, is that because these curves of costs are going down so fast across the board for everything uh, that my hope is that uh, we will it would actually it would actually reach more than before right we, we do still need to change how certain regulations have it and really change some mindsets in terms of um, how certain things are able to be accessed but in terms of costs and access the trend is towards more access I'll give you like an example like for example the Apple watch recent upgrade into having uh, you know EKG technology, right? So, uh, and that's you know five hundred dollars now. Right? Think of it. Maybe in a few years, it'll be maybe just a few hundred, and that technology will be pervasive. But then think about the amount of data now that we're capturing for um, in terms of health, uh, and then how that impacts uh, the preventive measures and other access to understanding biology and all these things. 
and then extrapolate and just keep going from there, right? Um, so it is trending towards more access across the board uh, because a lot of the technologies, enabling technologies, uh, we already have a lot of access to them, right? Mobile technologies, um, integrated circuits, cloud computing, edge computing, all these things uh, together, the trend is towards more access, uh, not less. Uh, but we still need to talk about it more um, publicly so that we make sure that it's top of mind for everyone. And, and they we're asking that for founders. Again, the founders that we back, that is at the core of what they think, right? That's what they want uh, is really for it to reach everyone, not just to be in the hands of a few. Uh, and some of them are, are just a core, core part of the open source ethos, right? That they're just what we were all sort of a part of. Does the open source movement make it hard to invest? Absolutely not. I don't think so. So, I mean, I think Facebook back in the day proved that that's the case, right? They built their entire stack uh, out of a LAMP stack, right? Uh, Linux, Apache, right? And, and PHP, et cetera. Um, where people said, oh, you know, PHP, you know, doesn't scale. Uh, I was like, well, um, Facebook is based on PHP, so I don't know what you guys are talking about, right? But people still say that, right? Because they don't know or they're not technical as investors, right? They're not engineers, right? And, and they've never built anything. So it's hard for them to understand how could you build something that has never been done before in that way. Uh, if you never have that mindset where it just feels like, yeah, you can actually stretch it and, and understand the technology to get it there. Um, so absolutely not. I mean, open source won, right? We won. I mean, and, and for context on my end, you know, I started my career on the open source side uh, and I went and worked at Microsoft uh, and then gave it to basically help them and tell them why they would lose. And they say, well, why don't you come and do it here? Uh, and then, you know, to come out of that, uh, and say, you know, that's amazing, but I want to help, you know, real people solve real, real problems and, you know, saving, uh, you know, someone 15 minutes of productivity. It's not sort of how I want to invest money. And I was, uh, that's just a small part of Microsoft. I love Microsoft. Um, but, you know, when you think about the, what happened now with, with Satya uh, changing how uh, Microsoft collaborates with the open source community, they open sourcing their CLR themselves, like their compiler. This is like at the core of Microsoft technology. Anyone can now poke around how compilers work. I mean, as an engineer, that's at the core of what you're able to build. And so, you know, 15, 20 years later, we won. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've seen this movie, let's say, right? I mean, you can't resist, uh, you know, builders' curiosity and builders' um, commitment to sharing what they've built and having it reach real people. Um, you can resist, but you will never, it's really difficult to stop. Just like this podcast and you, you know, sharing you know, this kind of information, you know, this does not exist, right? 10, 20 years ago, nobody would tell us the kinds of things that we're sharing now. And who's going to stop us, right? So the same thing applies to a lot of these technologies and, and open source as a, as a sort of global movement and, and commitment to sharing knowledge, not just open source. I mean, uh, we're talking papers and publishing and all these things, right? I mean, all these scientists sharing their data, collaborating. I mean, that this is all pushed in the direction towards uh, more transparency, more access, more data. So I want to take this a different direction now. Why did, Obram, why did Obama bring you to Cuba? Oh, so there's, there's just the story there. So the, the, the short version is, you know, when Obama announced, I'll oh, tell the story and you'll kind of get a good why. I guess why I was invited. I'm still trying to figure out myself. But um, the, the short version is when, when Obama announced that their, their, the, the regulations would change or the, the relations would change for Cuba, uh, the global startup ecosystem community primarily led through Startup Weekend. I don't know if you're familiar with Startup Weekend, right? So this, uh, you know, over a course of a weekend, you, you are able to create companies. Uh, this operates in over 600 cities around the world, everywhere from Iran to Yemen, right? To Israel to every major city or small city or small town everywhere. Um, and that community has been a part of and helped scale uh, over, um, over its life. And now it's now acquired by Techstars. Um, you know, we all, everybody talks with each other. Uh, and they know each other, but we did not have anyone in Cuba. So when that changed, my first my first comment to the, to the global community was, "Hey guys, you know, it sounds like there's a startup weekend happening. You know, who's making that happen?" Uh, and and basically, there's not just that there wasn't a response; is that there, we literally did not have uh, someone from the community on the ground that had real communications with Cuba. So it was really disconnected uh, from um, from everything, uh, which is which is was not was a surprise to everyone. Um, so that meant that it was us, right? That we were going to do it. Uh, we had to do it. Uh, and we, need to, we needed to find out who on the ground uh, had their community in mind and could share with us what they wanted that community to be and how they would, what, what does that look like? What does the technical system look like from the Cuban perspective? So I, I did a trip, you know, to Cuba 
uh, to basically find them because I've done that all over the world. I, I, it's easier, I guess, in, in my experience to find others that are builders and they build their communities. Uh, and through, through, through the network, I found uh, a set of guys that were running had run the first meetup uh, in, in Cuba. Uh, and they were able to navigate the, the politics and the local and everything around it so that everybody understood that it was around community building it was not about politics. Uh, and that enabled the entire global community to support them. Uh, and and Alex, uh, Alex Medina uh, and, and their crew, uh, you know, kudos to them uh, for, for really taking the risk uh, of, of really engaging with their community and really sharing and explaining and doing the education and everything internally uh, and, and guiding all of us on, on how to build community. So we did a startup weekend. Uh, that sort of weekend was very successful. Um, just getting the word out and everybody sort of really communicate and collaborate and, and connecting the uh, Cuban ecosystem with ecosystems globally. Uh, and from there, uh, you know, I was the first, you know, best on the ground. Everybody was talking about uh, investing in Cuba, but none had ever even been there. Um, none, you know, were looking at what the Cubans cared about. Uh, none of them really were, uh, you know, putting their capital over their mouth. It's actually going there and supporting founders and figuring out like how they can be helpful. Uh, so. I think a part of that, you know, just went around the rounds. I know that, you know, basically a few weeks before the trip, uh, you know, White House calls me, it's like, hey, you know, stand by, right? Like you, you know, you, you, uh, there might be a chance for, uh, be a part of like the president's team to go down there. Um, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> President Cole, like, what are you going to say? No. Um, so I was like, all right. Um, and, and I thought it was going to be a, a lot of people. I ended up, I pretty was like, you know, like why me? You know, I've been doing X. Um, but when we went down there, um, you know, there was a certain event around entrepreneurship and, and that was at the invite of both the Cuban government and the U.S. government, right? So it was a little bit different than just, just going there because the U.S. invites you. It's like you're actually vetted and invited by the Cuban government. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, and, you know, and when it was there, they kind of pulled us apart and we spent, you know, time with the president just when we were hanging out about, you know, what's the future of ecosystem building um, is about and kind of what's going on locally. And, and it was just, you know, us, the... Founders of Stripe, I mean, Shield style of um, uh, NEA at the time, uh, and he now runs his own fund, um, and just a few of us, right? So it was, yeah, that, so that's, that's how that happened. That's kind of why I guess the president reminded me was around, you know, actually doing versus the talking. I mean, you can imagine at the time the amount of chatter around Cuba, everybody talking about everything, but then, you know, what actually, what did people actually execute on uh, on the ground support, right? In terms of real companies or real innovation happening. Uh, and I was lucky that, you know, the founders on the ground of their community, you know, trusted me to support them. Um, just as we ask of any founder, right, that we invest in, like we ask them, you know, to, to trust us. And, and, and those, those guys down there, you know, they did. Uh, and, and we did what we say we're going to do. It's just help them do their thing. Not our thing, not a U.S. thing, uh, not what the president wants. It's really what they want. Uh, and that just happens to be what we all want, which is more community, more collaboration, you know, more innovation. Um, and it worked out. So, Was Cuba still yeah. communist at the time? Absolutely. Just like China is communist, right? And Vietnam. So people lose sight of the most successful communist country is um, honestly kicking the U.S. butt in a lot of ways. Um, it's communist. Um, and Vietnam as well. So people forget. Uh, and, and they like to emphasize you know, the difference around Cuba. And I was trying to share, that's just something I wrote about is, you know, uh, there's things that are like pro cons around it, but you know, the Cuban uh, healthcare ecosystem is something, the healthcare system is not something people need to really worry about. It's world-class compared to across Latin. I'm from Puerto Rico. So for context, I'm from Puerto Rico. So we're supposed to have the best in class everywhere global because we're US, I mean, we're a colony of the US, right? And, and that's super controversial and whatnot. Um, but we're supposed to have the best access in the U.S. side, and the Cubans, they just run laps around the kind of healthcare um, we have access to in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, same thing with education, right? Think about education at scale. Uh, they've, they've really had, you know, they lead right, in terms of literacy rates and, and education rates and access to university, uh, and, and they just have that. So through a communist country that's close to the U.S., so imagine if they had access to capital. Just imagine, right? Like what, what they could do if they had access to the markets, if they had access just like Mexico and uh, Panama or Colombia or Brazil had, right? And we could all collaborate together with the Cubans and the Canadians and everybody to just be like, hey, let's just build stuff uh, and figure it out. Just like every major VC uh, startup or whatnot is doing things in China, 
why can't we have the same conversation around Cuba? China, China and Vietnam are pseudo-communist in their, in their structures. Cuba was much more of a, a pure communist regime for a very long time. Vietnam yeah, I mean, is pretty can, much pure capitalism. We can get into like all, the, all the politics of it, but the short version is that it's all sort of the rules of the game of how to do business, and each of those countries had their own very specific and very difficult and complicated rules to get into the Chinese market, to do the Vietnamese market, same thing for the Cubans. There's a lot of uh, global companies are bringing out of, out of Cuba, especially now uh, through the change, but it's, uh, it's still difficult, primarily because of U.S. restrictions on, on the other international companies. So it's very interesting topic, which we can kind of dig in if you like. It's fine. Yeah, the, the U.S. does the same with Puerto Rico, right? Boats have to come from the U.S. to Puerto Rico, which makes everything more expensive. Yeah, so that applies to every island. So it applies to Hawaii, it applies to Alaska, right? So it was more of like a protectionist measure on the U.S. side, which everybody is fighting against, right? The Jones Act specifically. Uh, and, and that's uh, hopefully something that we also need to talk about. Like, there's no reason why that should be the case, right? Just, just change that, limit that, and let's just keep it moving. Um, because trade is much more complicated than just where the, where the boat trip comes from and how it needs to dock, right? Um, just because you change that doesn't mean that magically there will be a lot of trade going in and out from other sources into Puerto Rico uh, and the lines and freight lines and all these things that, that go with that. Uh, so it's a super interesting topic that we should have talk more of. How do we enable more trade in a way that helps um, those that don't have access to anything to really be a part of the global innovation community? That's what ecosystem building is about, right? It's, all these things are happening globally now versus before it was trying to be controlled, or it's supposed to be Silicon Valley, but now Silicon Valley is just half uh, of VC globally versus maybe 90% just a few years ago. Um, and that's just gonna continue to accelerate because there's just much more capital. And as founders, as we're all more successful and we build funds and we help funds, all these things, um, it just happens more and more, right? Uh, and we see that in, in the program I run in Puerto Rico, I support in, I'm an investment committee for in Puerto Rico, parallel, parallel 18, right? Where you have companies from 60 countries um, going now to Puerto Rico, and now these companies, now they have funding from, you know, tier one VCs everywhere. Well, you know, where were they when these companies needed funding in their countries, right? Uh, everybody talks about how they're uh, funding things for super risky on the first check side, but it's basically YC leading the way globally at scale, uh, and then maybe a few programs, but it's just YC, right? Really that first check for founders that don't know anybody, are not going to move to the Bay, right? they're not going to really build it in the traditional way, they're going to build it their way. Uh, and, you know, you see that in the companies that come out of uh, these ecosystems like, you know, Rappi, for example, you know, one of the most highest valued companies in, in LATAM, you know, YC company, right? Like, where were the investors then? So uh, it's uh, fascinating what's happening. It's just getting faster and faster for everything, not just uh, for tech, really it's bio, synthetic. And, and it's led by, you know, doers, right? Builders, um, entrepreneurs and uh, operators that understand now how, capital works as well. And so Ramfus, I think both of us would agree that we need to do a better job as a, as a species at allocating capital for the, the types of returns and change that we want to see in the world. Talk to me a little bit more about the impact investing side now that we lost all of that recording we just had. No, um, the short version of, of what we're discussing is that um, uh, the, purpose, the purpose of capital should be to finance the change that we all care about period, right? That your values are aligned with your investing. Uh, on our end, that looks to me personally uh, a science vest, obviously, right? We invest in core new technologies, uh, but there is uh, uh, a lens around the UN Sustainable Development Goals that, that we care about, right? So AI for marketing tech, no. Uh, AI for drug discovery for cancer research, yes. Uh, and then the impact investing side, that would apply for all kinds of uh, investments, uh, public investments, private investments, and then specifically the private investments on everything, right? That applies to funds and what they invest in and to real estate and everything else that's, that's possible there. Uh, and, and my view around impact is that uh, the returns are, are table stakes, right? They're, they're typically when people say impact, they, they immediately default to something that they don't, they don't really know about because they're just used to the financial instruments and the way finance are used to work. Uh, but now the opportunity around impact is that uh, the, the, we know how a lot of these seals or other opportunities work, uh, and it's really to support more of everything across the world. Uh, new kinds of fund managers all over the world is essentially an impact investing, right? Because what they will invest in 
uh, will reflect the environments that they're in. So if you invest in a fund, in a VC fund in South Africa that invests in the Pan-African region, uh, well, you can see the outcome will be companies like Andela, right? That could be viewed under the lens of impact versus your traditional thinking of impact, that it's some type of charity or philanthropy. Uh, and the other side of that, uh, at the other end, could be everything from affordable housing and how do you redefine the models uh, around impact and how do you facilitate that capital flow from the private markets and the private wealth to these opportunities on, on the other side, right? So that's really the space that I care a lot about and focused on uh, as well. And if you had a call to action for listeners, something you would want them to take away from this interview, look into a quote, et cetera, what would it be and why? At the core uh, would be that for those with, with the means, um, networks uh, and capital uh, to, to support and, and invest uh, in, in, in different types of assets, uh, to back, to back uh, things and, and companies and funds and managers and everything else that's just different, right? Uh, to really dig deep and understand uh, the opportunities that are available now that were not available before uh, and to trust that the change that they want to see will not look like whatever patterns uh, they are all used to looking for or looking at. Uh, so how they view uh, and understand those things, there's an opportunity, I would call them and invite them uh, to really fund the change that they want to see. Insanity is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. Last yeah. question. I know you got to run. What is a bold prediction with a timeline? Uh, bold prediction, I think that would be that within the next 10 years, we'll have uh, a path to market for uh, real therapies that, that target uh, ending uh, age, age certain age-related diseases, right? Or, or ending... Yeah, any injury disease. So we'll have therapies for uh, Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for, uh, for different types of cancer. Uh, but the focus will not be the disease. The, the focus will be around uh, enabling the body to operate as it did uh, when it was younger. Which would be incredible for all of us. How, how old do you think you're going to make it? Any predictions? Oh, man. I, I, you know, I wish, I wish, you know, there's a lot to do. So if, if I could uh, just uh, eliminate that clock, that'd be amazing. That would be amazing. I think that's what we're all headed for. Thanks for coming today, Ramfus. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Where's the best place for people to find you? Best place is uh, through Twitter, uh, J Ramfus, J-R-A-M-P-H-I-S. Awesome. And we'll throw links and everything in the show notes. Thanks and hope you guys enjoyed this. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Cheers. Cheers.